the Kaimanawa Wall is this a megalithic building? There has been a broadcast documentary and a lot of discussion about this wall on YouTube. I have studied megalithic buildings from an architectural perspective, so I decided to see for myself. So where is it? The Kaimanawa Wall is in New Zealand. Few people know where that is. New Zealand is a group of large islands in the South Pacific. Down under in the South Pacific is New Zealand and its neighbouring country, Australia. New Zealand was thrust up out of the ocean by tectonic plate movement. Consequently, it is on the Pacific Rim of Fire, a zone where earthquakes and volcanoes are common. Kaimanawa Wall is in a state forest park, which is native forest. The wall is easily accessed by a gravel forestry road, which fortunately runs right past it. Lake Taupo is the remains of an ancient volcanic caldera. To the south are two volcanoes which are active from time to time, but which you can otherwise ski upon. Drive several kilometres up a gravel forestry road through beautiful, lush native forest and off to one side you will see the wall, if you're looking carefully. This is a composite showing the two parts of the wall. They do not align. Note the tree which has been growing on top of it for about a hundred years. This is the main part of the wall. Six rectangular blocks are clearly visible. The face of the wall appears flush. It had to rain of course when it first arrived. The video. The Kaimanawa War. But it doesn't rain all the time in New Zealand, and the following day was splendid. This view shows the two rock faces which make up the wall. The figure gives a sense of scale. So what do the geologists think of the Kaimanawa Wall? They are unanimous that it is a naturally occurring ignimbrite or else rhyolite rock. An ignimbrite rock is deposited by a flow of hot particles of rock and gases flowing rapidly from a volcano. A rhyolite rock is an extruded volcanic rock. Their view is not surprising since there has been much volcanic activity in this area for millennia. The Hatepe eruption of approximately 180 AD was Lake Taupo's most recent major eruption. This eruption ejected approximately 120 cubic kilometres or 29 cubic miles of rock. This makes it one of the most violent eruptions in the last 5,000 years. An ignimbrite flow from the Hatepe eruption covers the Kaimanawa ranges and there are many rhyolite dome extrusions. Rapid cooling of the ignimbrite extrusion causes cracking in a geometric fashion. Note that the cracks in this example are roughly at right angles and cross through the cracks running in the opposite direction, very much like in our wall. It looks man-made, but it isn't. Let's look at how masonry walls were built in ancient times. There were three main methods. 
Rubble walls use irregular shaped blocks, either field stone or quarried stone with little or no dressing to shape them. As a consequence, the stone faces just touch here and there. This makes them less stable if left dry, so the stones may be set on a mortar bed of clay or lime. These walls are inexpensive and require less technical ability, but they are also less durable. Ashlar masonry has dressed rectangular blocks, usually of a uniform size, as this facilitates their manufacture. Horizontal joints are level for stability. Vertical joints are offset between rows. The resulting interlock holds the wall together. This is the most common method in classical Greek and Roman buildings. They usually use sandstone or marble, which are relatively easy to work. Political walls have blocks of different shapes and sizes. The blocks interlock in a complex manner, which makes for greater stability against earthquakes. The meeting faces match perfectly. This is the hard way to build in stone. Making perfectly matching, irregular sloping faces is technically inconceivable without modern digital CNC processes. Furthermore, these builders usually use granite, which is a very hard stone to work. Political masonry is mainly found in Peru and Mycenae in Greece. Masonry buildings are usually set out in plan in a regular manner, as this makes it easier to build and aesthetically pleasing. Walls are usually set out in straight lines. However, fortifications do often follow land contours and are therefore irregular in plan. Curves are usually radial. This also makes fabrication easier. Corners are usually at right angles, that is 90 degrees. In section, vertical walls have identical blocks, which makes them easier to build. Tapered walls with a wider base makes a wall more stable. Egyptian buildings often had tapering walls. Very high walls, or those required to resist military operations, require greater thickness. Instead of making them of solid construction, it is cheaper to have dressed stones on the outside and smaller rubble stones packed between them. Casement walls have a room inside rather than rubble. Stonework may have the faces dressed in different ways. Flat faced or ashlar, where the whole face is dressed off smooth. Rusticated, where the edges are dressed smooth and the body is left rough. This is cheaper to make as there is less dressing of the stone. Pillowed. The face is rounded off to all edges. This is typical of ancient Peruvian stonework. Manufacture requires the stone blocks to be transported from the quarry unfinished to avoid damage. The touching surfaces are then dressed accurately on site. Once in place, the face can then be dressed. Dry stone walls have no mortar. Mortar means the touching faces do not need to be so accurate. This is therefore quicker and cheaper. Megalithic walls are all dry stone. Mortar was used from the medieval period onward. Let's have a look at some examples of megalithic ancient buildings. This is the temple at Baalbek, Lebanon, with three stones over a thousand ton each. When the Romans conquered the area, they built a temple on top of the existing stone platform. The Giza Pyramids, Egypt. Most stones are a five ton, but some internal stones are up to 80 ton. There was a difference of less than 200 millimetres between the shortest and longest of its 230 metre long sides, an error amounting to less than one tenth of one percent. The error in the corner angles range from 3 minutes 33 seconds to only 2 seconds. Sixay Huayman, near Cusco, Peru. 100 to 200 ton blocks. Political masonry. Tijuanaco, Bolivia, up to 130 ton, very finely dressed stones. Stonehenge, UK, sandstone up to 50 ton. The lintels have a socket and spigot joint to the uprights. Mycenae, the citadel has 20 to 100 ton political masonry. The inset line gate has ashlar masonry. 
Hagar Keem in Malta, over 50 tom, considered to be the oldest known buildings. And the dolmens of the Golan Heights Israel, up to 5 ton. Dolmens are scattered over the whole planet, some with up to 20 ton stones, and there are many more megalithic building sites. So let's analyse our wall by comparing it with what we know about masonry construction. Are the courses level and straight? The horizontal bedding is not level as it should be, neither are the lines perfectly straight. Are the vertical joints straight and plumb? They are not. Neither are the vertical joints consistently the same. Are the vertical joints at right angles? They are not. The blocks are not rectangular either, nor are they uniform in size. Neither does the wall have the characteristics of political masonry. Is the wall face plumb? No, it is not. It slopes outward at the bottom and inward at the top, both in an irregular way. Are the vertical joints offset from each other between courses? No. Most of the vertical joints run straight through the horizontal course joints, like the natural ignimbrite cracks that we saw. Are the different parts of the wall geometrically aligned in plan? The two faces do not align, as would be typical of a man-made structure. Even if this was a fortification and followed the land contours, the two panels of the wall should align. I have included the site measurements here if you want more detail. In conclusion, it is not a rubble wall since the meeting faces match. It is not a national wall since it is not regular, level or plumb and the vertical joints are not offset. And it is not a polygonal wall since there is no complex interlocking of the blocks. If this was ashlar masonry, it would look like this. If it was polygonal masonry, it would look like this. I have to conclude that this is not man-made, as disappointing as that is, since it doesn't have the characteristics of masonry, and it is consistent with what we know of a rapidly cooled and fractured ignimbrite or rhyolitic volcanic rock. I'm an architect with an interest in megalithic architecture. Megalithic buildings are those built from very large stones. As a rule of thumb, I would suggest 2 to 5 ton and larger, although no one else wants to draw a line of demarcation. And 5 ton is the amount that Roman cranes could lift. Moving large stones is a very difficult engineering feat. The ancient Greeks and Romans were known to have moved large stones, such as the 40 ton architrave beam blocks of the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, and the obelisk that now stands in front of St Peter's Rome, which is 327 ton and was moved from Egypt by the early Romans. However, these buildings are documented and we know a little of Greek and Roman technical abilities. The assumption is that earlier cultures were more primitive and therefore did not have such technical abilities, but we actually find that some earlier buildings are set out accurately in relation to the Earth's poles and aligned with certain stars. They are also proportioned and erected with an accuracy that would be hard to equal today. As an architect, I find this intriguing. How can this be? Genesis chapter 6 of the Bible in the New International Version may give us a clue. It says, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, 
and then married any of them they chose. The Nephilim, which was rendered giants in the King James Version, were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. These men of renown had reputations in historic literature for performing great feats. Maybe they are the builders. They and their technology would have been destroyed by Noah's flood, so succeeding construction would be less sophisticated. And because of their size, megalithic buildings might have survived the flood. This explanation fits the facts. Here are a few great resources for further reading.